So welcome, welcome everyone to our Asian Coaching Supervisors Network. Uh, I think most of you have been in the past in our meetings. We meet once a month, the last uh, Wednesday, uh, the, la the last Tuesday of the month in the United States, the first Wednesday in, um, I'm sorry, the last Tuesday in United States and the last Wednesday in Asia, but today is a little bit different because it's the last Tuesday in the United States, but the first as a, as a different because that was the day that Catherine was available. So we make that difference. It's great to have everybody here today. We have every month different guests and our goal is to bring visibility to coaching supervision in Asia uh, and also Australia. We have people, many people from Australia here today. So we need to collaborate and support each other and learn together uh, and find different ways to bring awareness of what is coaching supervision and how people who are doing this job can support each other and learn from each other. So it's great to see uh, this network growing, this community growing. And today we have a very special guest, uh, Catherine, who is one of the pioneers of coaching supervision in the Americas and one of the first to work on research and begin some research to group supervision. So. Uh, Catherine, it's so great to have you here with us today. I'm wondering what would you like people to know about you? We're still getting some people to join us, but I um, mean, while we do that, what, what would you like people to know about you? Uh, well, Damien, thank you. And thank you for the invitation to be here. I am just delighted. I, um, as some of you know, I did re a research project over about five years of my life, and there's several aspects to it. This is only the second time I'm sharing these particular findings. And the first time I shared it was in mid-July with the America's Supervision Network as part of Damien's invitation. So I'm really curious. It's going to be compact in terms of, of what we do tonight. But um, I'm just hoping it you know, stirs something in you and informs something. So I think. The thing to know about me is I'm a grandmother, a great grandmother, an aunt, and a mom. And I live in Santa Barbara, California, which is west coast of the US, as you know, like you likely know. And I I enjoy fun and play, and I love supervision. I am so passionate about supervision. So I just look forward to being with you. So Damien, shall we start? Yes, let's let's start. Great. So um, a couple of things. I think given that we have just about 50, 55 minutes, what we'll do is we won't do breakouts today. Right? And I apologize for that because I know how good it is to get in small groups of three and four and have some time to talk. But I'd just like to share this with you. We'll pause three or four times for you to sort of collect your thoughts, reflect, add anything in the chat box or ask questions that you want. Um, but it's not going to be as expansive as reflective practice. So we'll just jump in and see how it goes. And let me share my screen. So a couple of things. You'll get copies of these slides if you want them. And this presentation and, and sort of what I'm sharing is captured in a new chapter in a new book that's coming out. And so I have that information for you at the end of the slide, but there's a new book coming out on group coaching supervision. And so I have one of the chapters and it talks about these three roles of the supervisor. I thought I'd start with this poem for me, this poem captures, captures supervision and what we try to create. Some of you may have heard this before because it's my favorite, so, um, or one of my favorites, but let me just read it um, and just invite you to arrive and, and to join um, just in this, this little bit of time together. What makes a fire burn is space between the logs, a breathing space. Too much of a good thing, too many logs packed in too tight, can douse the flames almost as surely as a pail of water would. 
So building fires requires attention to the spaces in between as much as to the wood. When we are able to build open spaces in the same way we have learned to pile on the logs, then we can come to see how it is fuel and absence of fuel together that make fire possible. We only need lay a log lightly from time to time. A fire grows simply because the space is there with openings in which the flame that knows just how it wants to burn can find its way. And I take to heart that's what we do as supervisors. We engage in holding this space, laying a log, a question or inquiry from time to time, but it is the coach and their passion and their, their needs that determine what happens. So with that, um, here's what I think we're about tonight as well. And let me see if I can move this. There we go. Um, Rachel Naomi Remen is a, is a physician in the US who's written um, some really interesting books. And I think of this as our mantra as supervisors, as colleagues, as coaches, with each other, with our clients, that it's not about having all the answers, but it's looking at what don't we understand, what don't we know, the unanswerable questions in good company. This is qualitative research happened in 2017, 2018. And so what I'm sharing are the experiences of these groups. There were five groups involved. And so I'm not saying at all, this is how supervision should be done. Not at all. I'm saying, here's what we discovered over the course of 18 months together about our own experiences in the small groups. And so the hope is, the invitation is for you to think about, compare and contrast what you do, what your experiences are as coach, supervisee, supervisor. And maybe it'll open a reflection. Maybe it'll open a possibility of experimenting with something. Maybe it will open something in you in terms of how you think about your work. So that's my intent. As I mentioned, we had five groups. All the coaches and supervisors were based in North America except one. Language was English. We were all certified by the same coaching school over the last 30 years. So although we had different levels of experience, we had a shared language. We had a lot of goodwill toward the organization that certified us and trained us as coaches. And that organization now offers and runs a supervision center um, for all their alumni. So there's a lot of goodwill in the groups. And one of the groups was brand new. One of the groups had been together at least six years. And you can see the groups varied in size. We had two, three, four, six, and seven coaches in the groups. I supervised two of the groups, and those supervision sessions and the recordings of them are part of the data that was collected. Three supervisors um, had the other groups, and for them, they met with me four times over 18 months to share what they were up to. And they sent me journal entries following their supervision sessions for those 18 months. So that's the context. So again, very different cultural context, perhaps, different ways of being. So it's food for thought. So here's what I'm going to offer and we'll explore a little bit. There emerged in the research, so this is all virtual, it's all small group, it's all done on Zoom, and there were 10 supervision sessions over a little over a year. And in between the supervision sessions, there were peer learning calls. So the coaches would come together without the supervisor and meet at the two week mark. So that's the structure. 
And these three roles emerged as most important for supervisors. And I expect they're very familiar to you. One is the leader of the group, one is the facilitator, and one is the guardian of reflective practice. And I'm gonna do a dive into what each of those mean. Um, but that, that was the, one of the key findings. Um, so if we look at the role as leader, it's all about the relationships. When I met with the groups in recruiting them and in our meetings during the course of their supervision, the most important thing to them was their relationship with the supervisor and with each other. And so I use the word leader to mean the person who helps co-cultivate, co-create the relationships among the coaches and the supervisor in the group. The academic literature for the most part talks about the supervisory relationship. And they talk about it as the supervisor and the supervisee paren or group close paren. That isn't at all what we experienced in these five groups. What we experienced is every relationship needed to be cultivated. So the supervisor needed an individual relationship with each member of the group. So this is an example of a group of six. And the coaches needed to cultivate relationships with each other and all of each other. So here, the blue lines represent the dyadic relationships. The gold lines represent the container, so the ultimate place in which we do our work with the supervisor in relationship with the group. But just dyadic relationships, there's 21 to cultivate. And so one of the, one of the questions is, how do we do that as a supervisor? And in our structure, the peer learning calls were an important part of that. But I think that's an unusual structure globally. Um, I know I have a lot of colleagues in Europe who prefer that the groups not meet except with the supervisor. But there's a lot of relationships to cultivate and paying attention to each of the coaches and one's relationship with those coaches is, at least in my research, a very different mindset than thinking about how do I cultivate the group relationship. And of course, our goal is this, I think. I think collectively, this is our goal. This is a quote from one of the participants. But I think we probably um, would agree that isn't this the kind of creation we want, that we want people to feel this way about the group, each member of the group and the supervisor. And one of the key things that emerged um, was, of course, the supervisor's qualities and his or her ability to observe their self and manage their self as well as to observe the others. But the co-creation of the relationships had a big um, impact by how do we create the shared purpose in the group? How do we cultivate, articulate, and tend to the shared purpose in the group? And prior to this, the, this research, when I did the initial organizing meetings, we would talk about why people came to supervision, but, we, but I never named it shared purpose. What are we here in service to? What is our shared collective purpose? And I do now in all of my groups. Um, and it seems to have really, just as it did in the research, it seems to have opened up this sense that 
it's not just my intention to come and do my own professional and personal growth and development, but it's my intention to come and be in service to the others. And it's articulating that on an ongoing basis. There's this great book by Coyle. Um, he calls it, the title of the book is Culture Code, and, and it's in the um, references at the, on the last slide. But he talks about our sense of belonging happens from the outside in, that we need the ongoing cues that says we are sharing, we are in this together. So let me just pause there. And my questions really are, and I'm gonna stop sharing for a minute so we can see each other. What's coming up for you? I don't know if you wanna share it in chat or if you just wanna jump in, but as I talk about the number of relationships in the group and the encouraging the cultivation of all of these relationships and the shared purpose, what's, what's coming up? Catherine, I, I had a question which is more a, a kind of a practicality question. When you say so that, that they were meeting outside, not only with the supervisor, was that orchestrated in terms of who meets with who or do they meet as a whole group? How, how was it uh, planned? Yeah, so when they sign up for supervision through our supervision center, they commit to the 10 supervision sessions with the supervisor and they commit to peer learning calls. Then they get to organize the peer learning calls in any way they want. Some groups treat it as a supervision session without the supervisor. Some groups use it as a book and article club. Some groups use it for business development cultivation. Um, during COVID, they used it for resourcing and supporting each other's. So they have control over how they organize their peer learning call. Um, but most frequently, it is, uh, it is a version of supervision and reflective practice. And it's typically our supervision sessions are 90 minutes. We pick a day of the month and a time. And typically, they pick the same day of the week, the same time two weeks later. And typically, their peer learning meetings are 60 minutes. And it varies by group. Most of the groups have vibrant peer learning calls and everybody shows up consistently, but it's like any group. Some groups fall off, sometimes three of the six show up or two of the four show up more consistently, but it's their design. Catherine. Uh, go ahead, yeah. Sana. If something major happens in this peer learning session, is that brought back to the group and vice versa? For instance, if something happens in the group supervision session, is it followed through outside in the peer learning group? It can be in both. I mean, it can be. So, for example, if something's happened in a session with me, I have um, gone back the next month and said, hey, you know, we had what seemed like a disruption to me in our session last month, and I took it to my supervisors. Do you want to talk about it? Shall we address it? And sometimes the group is ready. And often the group says, no, 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 everything was fine. Everything was fine. And I bring it the next month and I bring it the next month. And then at some point they're ready to talk about it. And um, often what the group will say is it really was between you and so-and-so. Why don't you two go talk about it and then come back and share with us what happened. And so we do that. Um, sometimes there has been a disruption in the peer learning calls, but it seldom comes into the supervisor session. They work it out um, for the most part. It's, I, I'm thinking, you know, because I have permission to talk about what happened in the research groups, but not beyond that, right? Because all, 
as is your work as confidential, so is mine. But in the research groups, there was no disruption in a peer learning call. Yeah. But you know, it's a very interesting thing, isn't it? And and I understand why my colleagues, um, some of my colleagues in Europe prefer not to have the groups meet without them. But it really seems to work in our setting um, for cultivation of the relationship and, and the work. Catherine, you haven't uh, said uh, anything uh, yet about um, some of the things that you did as leader to help co-create these uh, many relationships. But as you were speaking about what you were speaking about, it made me think about psychological safety mm -hmm. and um, you know how you know we're especially talking about providing a shared purpose and um, helping people get comfortable with each other so that they can achieve what they wish to achieve. It made me think of psychological safety. Yeah, I think it's a really important piece, of course. And I'm going to talk in a minute about the six qualities that ended up being present in the groups. Um, but I mean, there's some interesting things about psychological safety, um, one of which is there's so much that can disrupt safety for an individual or for the group that has nothing to do with what happens in the session or who or how the supervisor is. Um, an example of that would be someone has just um, learned about biopsy results. This happened in the research. They could not settle and be present and feel safe in that supervision group that morning, no matter what. In another case, um, a person's inner critic and their own narrative of their value or lack of value got in the way of their feeling safe in the group in a particular situation. And completely outside the awareness of the supervisor, I only found out about it when I got the journal entry a week later that said, um, I'm still, questioning my value to the group. And I feel like I was so disruptive. We didn't know. So there are you know, social factors, cultural norms of what can come into supervision, what can't in terms of safety. There's the inner critic and our own narratives of our standing and our ways of being and what we want to share and not share. There's something that could happen proximate to the session, such as the biopsy results or a a spouse being diagnosed or partner, um, or just learning that you're being forced into retirement. It's really hard to come and be in a supervision group in that, in that setting and be safe. And then there's what could happen that would disrupt the safety for an individual that we may or may not know. Um, and then there's, we all know we're not safe. And working that and repairing it, remedying it. So there's a lot to it for sure. Yeah. I see there's a question about what the gold lines, the golden lines meet, mean. It means those, those are the things, those represent the things that we do to create the safe container, the safe place for the group to be. Is what they mean. There's not anything significant about the number of them. It's just to create a bowl, the outlines of a bowl for a container. Um, yeah, and I'm just looking at, at the comment about individual values. Absolutely, individual values impact significantly, of course, how we supervise and how our supervisees come and how they coach. If it's all right, let me go back to the PowerPoint. Um, and let's look at the second role. So the first one is really about that cultivation of relationships and, and the, the comment about um, what am I doing and, and how are we working together? I'm gonna talk about under the heading of facilitation. But I, I, they go hand in hand. Um, in part, facilitation, of course, is contracting, right? It's the three levels of contracting, how we initially design, 
what our preferences and styles are. Do we want to interview group members? In my world, we don't. People sign up or self either sign up to be part of a group they don't know or they sign up with a self-formed group. Um, but many supervisors do interviews and accept and, and not accept it, but it's how many do we want in a group, right? What are we gonna charge, all of that good stuff. And then there's the overall structure of the process and the operating principles, right? This is the beginning of how we're gonna work together. What do we need? Are we gonna record, not record? Are we gonna um, do, co-facilitation? Are we going to be co-inquirers or is it in essence the group watching the supervisor supervise one-on-one? -on -one? I mean all those different structure process operating principles and then of course what happens session by session that contracting we do in the moment. Within that contracting There were, let me see if I can move this again, because it's, there we go. Within that contracting, the facilitation and the contracting encompassed six qualities. Six qualities that the supervisor invited the group to adopt or made conscious and articulated it as um, part of the process. So you'll see I've overlaid these on shared purpose. So we still have the supervisor at the center, but here are the six qualities that emerge in all five groups. One is expansive acceptance and that was most often the tone for that was set by the supervisor and then the group moved into that space. And that is really about having the warmth and grace to stay really centered, grounded, present with what's happening and accept the supervisees however they come. Um, and, you know, there's an interesting example in this. I ended up in two, well, in one of my groups in particular, using the phrase from Ram Dass's teacher, um, can't you see it's all perfect? So if they showed up unprepared, turned out it often made space for a coach who had something that was bigger than they would normally have. Or if they came in depleted and exhausted, it was okay. They could just be there. The second is around um, challenge and possibilities. There was no safe space unless there were honest challenges to what the coach was presenting. The ability of the group to challenge in the sense of opening possibilities, wondering about what the coach's story was about a particular incident. That increased the sense of safety, increased the expansiveness of the container for the work. Because in part, it contributed to the shared purpose. Right? If we're there for learning and development and we don't challenge, what are we doing? And there was a particular moment in one of the groups where one of the coaches, so this group was in their fourth year, and one of the coaches said, uh, maybe in the eighth of 10 sessions, said all of a sudden, she said, I just realized that I go to solution when all of you stay in inquiry. And she did. She had for almost four years 
with every presenting coach said, here's what you need to do. I know about your client and your client, blah, 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 blah. And she said, I just realized that pivotal moment, right? I just realized that. And I'm wondering how it is for the group. And we had the opportunity to say to her, it's not very effective for us. It shuts down the opening of possibilities. And you're right, it's great that you noticed. What, how do you wanna explore this? What do you wanna do with the question you just asked? I was supervising before I could move in to say anything, the group immediately reassured her. And we had all been singed before by her responses to our, our feedback to her. And so I didn't intervene and I didn't say anything. I didn't, I didn't pause and say, can we look at what's happening in the group? Can we look at what we just did? Can we look at that we're colluding and, and limiting her growth? And my sense in rewatching the recordings and in really sitting and thinking about what happened is the safety decreased in that moment because we weren't honest. We weren't straightforward. So I think challenge and possibility is a really important piece. Um, experimentation proved to be an energy builder in all of the groups. And it's experimentation with permission. So for example, if we typically respond um, with a coach who's presenting their case and ask them what their inquiry is and then delve into them, I would on occasion, or the other supervisors would on occasion say, great, so we know what your inquiry is. We wanna do that with you and honor what you just asked. And I'm wondering if the group would allow us to do something, just try something first before we go to your inquiry. And the groups often said yes, every now and then they didn't, um, but it's permission-based, right? So if they didn't, we went on. But if they did say yes, and if the presenting coach agreed, of course, then we would offer, or I would offer. So sometimes I'd say, well, what image, draw an image, what image came up for you as the presenting coach was presenting? And then we'd just share the image. Or what got stirred up in you as a coach? What did you notice about yourself as this coach was presenting? Or what feelings and emotions came up? You know, whatever the different ways of experimenting with it, the inquiry were, all of the groups said that experimentation opened up energy, opened up curiosity, opened up a different way of inquiring, and they learned something that they hadn't learned in the past. So there was a real element of, yeah, let's mix it up every now and then, as long as everybody's willing. Shared vulnerability. Um, really came up as essential. And there's a very interesting question in, my, in the five groups about shared vulnerability. In two of the groups, some number of the coaches in the group had retired from coaching. They'd either moved to another business endeavor, they'd literally retired, they had moved to just training and facilitation rather than coaching, but they stayed in the group because it was their community. And what happened is, of course, then they didn't bring cases or issues or themes. And so while they had the depth of experience to offer inquiry with their colleagues, there was no vulnerability for their own work. And what one of those groups ended up doing the following year was creating the situation where everybody had to bring something. And if you weren't coaching, you had to bring an issue theme or case around who and how you were in your current role. Because they saw that without that shared vulnerability, they were not each, the coaches were not bringing all of the messiness and the success of their coaching to the group. 
So the shared vulnerability piece turned out to be really important and it includes the vulnerability of the supervisors. So the supervisor's willingness to say, I've been stuck, I've moved to solution. I need your help with a client. I've been there. It's a really, really important part of the facilitation of the groups. And, you know, sometimes it was met. I remember, I think some of you have heard this story. I remember the first time I said to one of my groups, because I've been reading about self-disclosure by supervisors in the clinical psych literature. And I said to them, hey, I'm stuck with a coaching client. Will you all supervise me today? And they laughed. Nervous laugh, but they laughed. And one of them said, well, that's ironic. Why did we hire you? if you're not a master coach. And we had this fabulous discussion about what is mastery and does one ever arrive? And are you ever in a position where you're not ever stuck? I mean, I will never be in that position, that's for sure. Um, and then they supervised me. So now that was 2017, 2018, the group is still meeting with me. So what are we? We're five years out, right? four years out, they still refer to that moment in time that opened up how much more they could bring, how much more willing they were to come. And then the empathy and gratitude piece is really a cultural norm um, that I didn't appreciate until this research um, and hadn't articulated it to the groups. But what was clear in all five groups was there was a lot of gratitude and empathy for the presenting coach and for each other. So while there was challenge and challenge was essential, the ability to say to the to the colleagues, to the supervisees, the other supervisees, the other group members. By name, thank you for that question. Thank you for observing that. Thank you for noticing that. That opened up in me, right? The ability for the inquirer to say, gosh, I hear how much struggle you're in. And I wonder, blah, blah, blah. Huge factor in creating this safe space, but, and of course, deepening the relationships. So I'm curious about, you know, what's coming up for you at this point. So let me stop the share. And just see, how do you facilitate? How do you think about these six qualities? what's missing or what doesn't make sense or just anything. Yeah, so, and I see the question, the deployment, how were the deployment of the six qualities measured? So I listened to hundreds of hours of recordings and did um, four sessions with each of the groups. And then of course I had the two groups that I was with. And, and then I had all the journaling entries after each of the um, session so I could see each of the individual coaches perspectives which often reading them you thought that they were in different groups in some respects and in the same groups in other respects um, so it's not quantitative data that's why I said this isn't how it should be done this is our experience um, so measured, it was measured by doing an, a, narr a narrative analysis of what happened in the groups. And those are the six qualities that emerged in addition to shared purpose. So what else? What else is stirring? So Katrina, we're thinking about the facilitation and the exploration element, how creative we can be. Yeah. And I think I, I really love group supervision because of that, because it gives us the opportunity to be creative. But that means also to take some risks. And the question for everybody here is how willing are you to take risks? And when is the right time too? Because it seems that if the relationship is key, 
it seems that first you need to have a relationship with the participants so they can trust you that when you bring a different technique, exercise, or you bring your creativity, people will be willing and will be safe to try something different. What do you think about that? Yeah, Damien, I think there's, I think there is this ongoing, if we notice something's holding us back, what's that telling us about us? And what's that telling us about the group? And of course, these groups develop over time. Right, so at the end of the first season of supervision, in my case, at the end of each year, the group has, has you know, this much relationship. And at the second year, it's bigger and bigger and the third year and, and the work we can do is magnificently different over time. And we do good work the first year. It's just where we all are at that point. I know a lot of people here that have a lot to say about it. I don't know why everybody's so quiet talking about taking risks and sharing. Anybody have a question or comment? Here's it. We have some very experienced supervisors and group supervisors. So I wonder if anybody want to share some of your reactions. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm aware that I, I don't want to uh, take airtime away and that I've already spoken. So I'll just speak quickly. Uh, so the six qualities, I'm a little confused. I only saw five actually. So maybe that's a mathematical uh, uh, limitation I've got. Um, uh, but of the qualities, my understanding, Catherine, so I guess I'm asking if my understanding is correct, that these are qualities which the supervisor brings as the facilitator and also endeavors to evoke in the whole group. Do I have it right? Yes. And which of the six, I, so I've got the five in the circle. Are you counting as the sixth quality shared purpose? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. There are a couple of comments in the chat room also, if you want to, can you see them? I have lost the Zoom momentarily. There you are. Okay. Maybe I can speak to the one I put. Um, just on that kind of building on what Jeff said, the shared purpose. Like to me, the five that you went over, I kind of felt like the learning and harvesting that and applying that to impact your practice wasn't explicitly said. And I would feel like that's a huge chunk of it. Is that maybe implied in the shared purpose or? No, it's in um, Guardian of Reflective Practice, Larissa. Oh, okay. So let's go there. But the third role that I have for the supervisor is we are that guardian of ensuring reflective practice. And so I put it there, but you know, you can you can put it anywhere, right? Because it's so important. Mm. How do we capture and and um, you know that there are within that opportunity within the group supervision sessions for coaches to reflect practice being a coach right practice experiment plan future actions do it with their clients and then um, see what they learn. So let me, Scott, I was just looking at your question. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. Who would not want to be in a group like that? Yeah, <laughs> it is fun, that's for sure. Um, let me come back here for a minute and jump there for a minute, um, Larissa, just because of your comment, right? It's, it's the protection of the purpose of supervision. It's not a conversation. It is there in service to the coach's personal and professional development resourcing um, capabilities. And, and so it's, it is important that we as supervisors, of course, provide these 
opportunities for each of the coaches in each of the sessions to pause, to observe themselves, right? A key skill that develops in the however many in the early years of supervision often, inquiring with them and then they're considering what's happened. And in that consideration, it's each of us as coaches, isn't it? Um, I'm gonna go past this slide for a minute. This is Isaac's on dialogue, right? About, about um, the elements of dialogue. But so we've got the presenting coach and it's important that we protect their time and we protect their inquiry. And we ensure that we stay consistent with what their inquiry is and what they want to explore. And at the same time, it's the group members noticing what's happening for them and co-inquiring to open up the possibilities and perspectives and maybe enable future actions and experiments. And it's this, the challenging right of our own narratives and biases. What was true in most of the groups in most sessions is at the end of the presenting coach inquiry, when we paused and said to the presenting coach, so what are you sitting with or taking with, or where are you with respect to the issue theme matter that you brought? Then we go to each member of the group and say to them, for yourself as coach or as human, what are you taking for your own personal or professional growth? And it's taking the time in each session to do that, that in your words, harvests that learning, right? Gives them an opportunity to think about themselves and how they're similarly situated. And, and of course, what happens in that context is that when the presenting coach is presenting, the group members are with them but they're also thinking about their clients that may be similarly situated. They're thinking about how they might coach that client. They're thinking about and noticing their own inquiry for the presenting coach, but their own judgments about it. And making that more explicit to the group, helping them see what is going on in that context. So not just, I guess in part what I'm saying is in these groups, it wasn't just doing the supervision sessions, but it was articulating what all the possibilities were in the session. And so a way of capturing it is there's what happens ahead of the session that's reflection. In my two groups, I send reflection questions a few days in advance of each session. So I might send a reflection question like, what are you noticing about your curiosity? What increases it, what shuts it down? Or I might ask um, what they're noticing about their judgment. Or you know, I've got a whole bunch of reflection questions I send out and sometimes they resonate with the group and sometimes they don't. And when they don't, we don't spend any time there. Then you have all the reflection and learning in the session. But then there was so much post-session reflection that went on um, where the coach, one of the coaches, for example, noticed, gosh, when my colleague checked in in our session today and said he was just really in a unresourced dark place and struggling. My heart expanded and opened to him and I so understood why he was where he was. And yet, now that I'm thinking about the session, I notice I have a client who comes to me in that same state and I am so impatient with that client. And I'm so anxious for that client to make progress and work toward their goals. And my heart closes down. And I'm wondering what is it in me 
that I can hold that for my colleague, but not my client? And what do I need to cultivate to hold that for my client? And then there's the experimentation and integration with clients. For example, one, one coach loved the pre-session reflection questions because it put her into a reflective space. So she started sending them, contracted for it with some clients who were willing to experiment and started sending to some of her clients pre-session reflection questions. And for those it worked for to move them into reflective space ahead of the coaching session, she kept doing it. So there's that experimentation integration with all the stuff that comes up in the session. So for me, the opportunities of supervision aren't just what happens in the session, but are all of that, all of that. And it's our, it is of course our responsibility to make sure that that is a part of the process and that we guard it, that we, that we ensure it and that we manage the group dynamics in service of it. So Larissa, thank you for that comment. Let me stop share. Thanks for explaining. Yeah, yeah. So we have a few minutes and um, Damien, are you gonna want the slide deck? Yeah, that would be good, and we can share with the participants in our website that we are remodeling, but we have an, a website with all of the past uh, recordings and the webinar from the last two years. And also, we can, if that's okay with you, do you wanna, we can share it there, I can also send it to uh, no, I, the next I'm, invitation, with invitation to the next meeting, I can share the link to this recording and the link also to the... I'm happy to send it to you. The reason I ask is there's a couple of slides with the references, for example, and the title of the book that my chapter's in, that, that I'd rather take your questions than go through, but I wanted you to know they were there and you'd have access to them. So I'm just curious, what, what are you feeling, thinking, wondering? I can come in here. Thank you, Catherine for what you've shared. And I, I was actually, when I heard Damien speak earlier, um, I resonated with what you were sharing, Damien, about that safe, creating that safe place to have these really um, stretching, sometimes stretching conversations, but particularly if someone brings in a question that really uh, is perhaps for want of a better expression, a curveball, so to speak. Um, and what was coming up for me when you were speaking as well, Catherine, was I, I, I went back into a memory of when I was on Damien's uh, supervision program and we were looking at group supervision. And I remember there was a demonstration that, that was done and there were a number of us involved uh, as part of the group supervision demonstration. And then one of the coaches um, threw out something out there that was quite, it was, it was quite, oh, <laughs> and, and I remember there were quite a few various different reactions that were polar. Um, so it, it really did create, uh, yeah, an interesting discussion. But I think because that safety and trust was there, it enabled to have those, you know, ongoing reflection about that particular demonstration and what was shared. So it was really, it really opened up so many different um, levels of learning because of that, that safety that had been created and those relationships that had been created with the group as well. We're, we're still, as Damien knows, we're still a very tight group that uh, are still very connected and, and we're potentially going to do some group supervision with that cohort, that particular cohort. So as a consequence of the relationships, the tight relationships that were built. So, so that was what was coming up for me, some good memories and also a memory, a memory of, oh, <laughs> this is yeah. really, um, oh, charge, you know, creating a lot of charge for quite a number of people. So, um, but it was, it all, the learning continued and it was a very, very good thing. 
Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. I mean, it's a, it's a great demonstration, right, of what I've been talking about in terms of when you've got the base. And you know, when stuff like that, the curveball comes, we all know it's a curveball. Yet it sometimes takes courage for us to name it and to say, hey, let's use this. Yeah, thank you. What else? We have time for one more person before we wrap up. We need to make a couple of announcements before we finish. So anybody that will have a question or a comment, something you want to share before we wrap up? I see the question about um, validating the hypothesis. It actually was different than that. And I love the word just narrative analysis. So, um, so I did my research at Middlesex University in London in a practitioner-based doctorate program. So it is structured particularly for practitioner researchers working toward understanding our field of practice as opposed to working toward an academic position. And I love that. And in that, we had a lot of opportunity to do qualitative, quantitative, whatever. And I chose qualitative. And within that, because narrative is so important in coaching and in supervision, I did a narrative inquiry and then narrative analysis of the recordings. And so, yes, it is just that. That's what it is. Yeah. So, Catherine, right. we need to, to finish here. But it Over was to great you, to have you. It was, it was a really great session, a lot of learning. So thank you for your time and your support and being here today and last month at the America Coaching Supervisor Network. We hope that you may present at our conference coming up next year. So I just uh, download in the chat room the call for abstracts. Great. We are having the conference April 28, uh, 29, and 30 of April next year. The uh, deadline to send the call for abstract is September 15th. And I want to encourage everybody here to, to present, to come and share and do an activity, get people to think together, to reflect together, to do an exercise. You don't need to do a lecture. Can we, re we want more workshops where people can uh, work together. So I want to encourage everyone here to, to, to send an abstract. And also, this is a space, it's a learning community where we rotate who is presenting. So everybody's welcome to present. And next month we have Simjo. And I asked Simjo, do you want to tell people what you're going to be talking next month? So you, when you receive the invitation, you will know more detail, but at least today you can give a preview of what you're going to be doing. Um, the topic of reflective practice has been resolved for me a lot. So it's actually, yeah, it's going to continue on and a little bit more and maybe supervision and executive because of uh, the corporate clients uh, we work with. And it's, you know, I, I always feel that it's, it's good to support the uh, leaders to, to build a muscle of reflection. So executive reflection is something in, and in a systemic perspective. So I love what you shared, Catherine. It really, really resonates for me that I'm actually... Uh, at, I'm at a heart level rather than a head level. Totally resonates for me and, and love what you just shared. Thank you. Thank you. And yours sounds like a really timely presentation next month. That's great. And if you want to download I, in the chat room, I posted the call for abstract. So if you wanted to download it so you can have it handy. And also, Catherine is also leading the ICF community of practice. What is a, I don't know how many of you know that finally ICF is having exactly. this community of practice. <laughs> and Catherine is one of the leaders. So, and your next session, the second session is coming up in, in a few weeks. Do you want to share briefly about that? Yeah, it is. Thank you, Damien. It is September 20th. And, um, we're going to continue our conversation about reflective practice as the heart of supervision. It's one perspective on supervision. Then in November, we have Robin Showett coming, talking about love and fear and supervision. And then in January, we have Pam McLean talking about self as coach in the supervision context. So 
do come and as you know they're recorded and um, I think May of next year we're going to do one that is a much better time for you it's two hours later than we are right now so it'll be it'll be for all of you as well so you can see it live yeah that's great that's a good problem what is the COP called I'm sorry say it again this is COP of what COP of supervision community of practice of what? CF, community of practice. So the International Confederation now has, we have different communities of practice on different topics. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, this year, finally started one on coaching supervision. So okay. this is what Catherine is leading with a colleague. Okay. And the second session is going to be on the September the 20th, 20th. at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. So if you can make it, you can find information also in the website. But I don't know if there is any information, Catherine, that uh, any link or what you can... Um, let me find... Yeah, um, I'll post it while you're doing the closing, Damien, okay, or we can... Yeah. Really? So something else that um, we want to start, we have a website and we... Uh, I have not spent a lot of time on it and I need some help. So if anybody is willing to help me, like I am a little bit lonely doing this, so if anybody is willing to help me a little bit with our website for the Asian Supervisor Network, what I would like to have is one page for each country. And I would like to invite everybody here to participate. Like if we have a page for Singapore, from India, China, Australia that are represented here today. So uh, Malaysia, and so Philippines. Uh, we have also Uruguay, Gerard in the middle of the night, who <laughs> see you here. I don't know sure about having that page there. But uh, if you want to uh, consider the possibility to uh, support me in having inside the Asian Supervisor Network website pages for each country with what's going on in the country, with your own ideas, blogs that you can come up with your experiences in supervising in the different countries, I think that, that can be helpful to um, helping the mission of that we're having here, the purposes, bringing more visibility. So I want to invite everybody to consider that if you're interested, please let me know. So we can, in between everybody, we can support each other and collaborate in making that happen. So with that, uh, Catherine got there the um, place to go. This is the link to, to mm -hmm. register for the session. Yeah. Great, good. Thanks everybody. Good seeing everyone. We hope to see you uh, next month in all of the different activities coming up. Have a good day, good evening, wherever you are. Great seeing everybody. See you soon. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.